So once again, uh, everyone, we uh, are thrilled to have with us Dr. Jeannie Constantino, who will be speaking on uh, women in the early church. Uh, by by an oversight on my part, we did not start recording okay, thank you. 15, 15 minutes ago. So um, we've we had an opening prayer. I spoke about this this study uh, over over the last four or five years and this evening and where you can find other seasonal studies that we've done. Uh, contact me if you're interested in those. But I'm just going to ask Dr. Jeannie to just do a summary of what she said thus far and then continue on with her talk. Thank you, Dr. Okay, Father. Uh, thank you, Father. Uh, yes, I will be happy to say what, one of the things to summarize briefly what I mentioned. And I should have noticed too, Father, that I didn't hear the little, you know, this is being recorded message, which should have give, given me a clue that you forgot to start the recording. Uh, that's okay, Father. So um, what I was mentioning is we're, this is supposed to be a three part series. And the first part, beginning tonight, we're going to be talking about women in first century Judaism, what was their life like? And also what was it like for uh, the female followers of Christ? And then next week in part two, we're going to talk about women in the early church, especially people who were the coworkers and companions of St. Paul, the women who knew Paul, and also that some of the things that St. Paul writes about women that have been used inappropriately, incorrectly, interpreted wrongly um, that St. Paul writes about women. And then the last week, we're going to talk about uh, women deacons in the early church. How do they function? Um, and is this something that we should have in orthodoxy uh, today? And if so, why? If not, why not? So we, I hope also to have some discussion at the end questions and answers at the end of each of these. So I'm trying to Make sure I leave some time for your comments and insights, which I'm sure will be very valuable and useful. So the other thing that I had mentioned was, um, why are we talking about women in the early church? And why not just go straight to what do we need to do today? Why is does this matter what the early church did? Because there are Christians who say, who cares about what the early church did or what the early church thought? But we do. As Orthodox Christians, the most important thing for us is that we preserve what the ancient church taught, believed, and how they lived. This is what makes us Orthodox. That's why our point of reference is always the early church. And so that's that will also be our, our point of reference when we interpret the words of St. Paul next week. And then in week three, when we talk about how the church used women deacons, and whether or not we should have them today, and if so, in what capacity. Our point of reference, our point of comparison, our jumping off point is always early church. Now, why is that? Because what the early church did, taught, believed, was given to the apostles by the Lord. It's not because we're somehow enamored with antiquity. It's because these instructions came from Christ. And we don't think we can improve on that. We're not in a position to change that. And that's why the Orthodox are so um, insistent on following only what was practiced in the early church. That is not to say that the church has never changed even a wee little bit. Clearly, there have been some changes, but comparatively little since the time of the early church. So let's go on to lesson one, which is tonight. And we're going to be talking about women in first century Judaism. And my comments tonight are taken from research that I have been doing, um, especially in the area of Jewish law, because I would like to understand the lives of the women disciples of the Lord who lived in first century Palestine. And it has been noted, by the way, by many people um, that, that many of the adherents of Christianity had possibly the majority of the first Christians were women. And a lot of that had to do with the attitude of Christ and the church toward women. Because what is happening today is there are many people in the culture that try to present the church as, the, as, a, as an institution that oppresses women. But Christ was and the church were the great liberators of women. And I'm going to show you how that's the case. 
So women in first century Judaism. Um, and what I'm talking about today is also still true today for women in the most conservative Jewish circles like Orthodox Judaism, Hasidic Judaism. Women in first century Judaism and in those conservative or Orthodox communities today, they had very little autonomy, grown women. Their life was very restricted. Um, and um, their only opportunity for any really measure of freedom and autonomy was if they were unmarried and if they had money. And this gave them a kind of a freedom and autonomy that otherwise they wouldn't have because they were almost always under the authority of a man. A girl was under her father's authority. And at the age of 12, between the age of 12 and 12 and a half, he had that narrow window of opportunity to betroth her and marry her off to whatever man he chose. Now, if he did that before the age of 12 or after the age of 12 and a half, she did not have to accept it. And if she was already married before the age of 12, she could nullify the, the marriage completely or she could choose her own husband. So it's very interesting that they had this very narrow window of time, but it was a, at a very, very young age, something we would hardly consider a girl of 12 ready for marriage. But that was the window of time during which a father chose a husband for his daughter. And then she came under the authority of her husband and she received a dowry and that went to the husband and he could manage it and do pretty much whatever he wanted with it. However, if he divorced her, he had to give it back to her, which is one reason that's one, at least one thing that sort of um, made men reconsider whether or not they wanted to divorce their wife because they were supposed to re give back the dowry. The dowry was the only real security she had. Now, if her husband died and she became a widow, then she had the right to her property to manage her property, but otherwise everything was controlled by the husband. When she got married, they signed a marriage contract. And this happens today in Judaism among all kinds of Jews. And the marriage contract was called a ketubah. And it spelled out all of the responsibilities and rights of each party. This is quite you know, fascinating to me as a lawyer because as a, and as a Christian, we don't enter marriage this way as a contract that this is what the husband has to provide, this is what the wife has to do, and it stipulates everything. But this is exactly right. And there were, if there was no ketubah, but there was always a ketubah, or if the ketubah was silent on the responsibilities or rights of each of the parties, there was sort of a, a body of law, of Jewish law, that determined what was what were the expectations and responsibilities of each party. But think of, of what it would be like if your relationship with your husband or your wife was really very, very legal. Now, I'm not saying that people didn't really have real affection or real love for each other, but underlying everything was the contract. And, and among the things that it would say, that would literally stipulate, was how much wool, how much cloth, uh, a wife had to produce because she was expected to provide or to help with the financial um, maintenance of the household. And that involved weaving cloth. And uh, she had to produce a certain amount of cloth and it's in the contract, how much she had to produce. And if she was pregnant or breastfeeding, then she was, that amount was reduced by contract, mind you. Um, recognition of the fact that maybe she wasn't able to put in as much time because she was expecting or she was breastfeeding. Um, the, it also, the contract also spelled out other things like the fact that she was allowed to, to visit her relatives or that was an expectation. She was allowed to eat her favorite foods. The fact that the husband was required to provide her food was in the marriage contract that he had to give her an allowance to get new clothes and new sandals at least twice a year. These things were literally in the marriage contract. And um, it was, it's quite a remarkable thing to me that they were a, that, that these things had to be spelled out in a contract. 
And um, some of them were more elaborate. They had other things, but everything was put into the contract. Now, women were viewed by men in a, who, who were in a position of religious authority in a rather negative way. Now, women were confined to the home almost exclusively. They did not usually have any kind of public life in, among Jews. And most scholars believe, I, and I share this belief, that Jewish men were very nervous about being in the presence of women because of the fear of becoming contaminated or rendered impure by coming into contact with a menstruating woman. One of the most um, important responsibilities under the law of Moses of a woman was to keep track of her cycle and make sure she did not come in contact with any man during the, so it was a certain number of days prior and during her flow, and then a certain number of days afterwards that when it was ending. During that window of time, she was not to have any contact with a man because she would render him, just by touching him or touching his clothes, she would make him impure. She would defile him. And since men can't tell just by looking at a woman whether or not she's menstruating, they were very concerned. And this is one of the reasons why women were really kept apart from men. Um, it was considered an extremely serious violation of the law of Moses for a woman not to track her cycle and make sure that she did not contaminate, when I just use that word, I mean, make a man ritually impure by touching him or anything that came into contact with him. This was considered so serious that rabbis actually used to say that when a woman died in childbirth, it was because she hadn't been careful enough and she had caused a man to become ritually impure. And as you can imagine, this was terrifying to women. And this is how they made them frightened enough to be sure that they, during this, this period, were, were remaining separated from men so that they would sequester themselves and keep themselves in a, in a place where they would not unintentionally uh, defile a man. So you can, you can see how, how, of, how concerned they were about the presence of women. And this is one reason why they were really excluded from many, many things. Now, women were not on the level of slaves. A wife, for example, was not on the level of a slave. They had some freedom. They had certain rights and they had some autonomy. However, a slave had none, but they were barely above, we could say the level of a slave because they had a right to be fed by their husband. They had a right to food. They had a right to visit their relatives, as I mentioned. They had a right to new clothes. Slaves didn't have any of those rights. And by the way, the girls did not have the right to be fed by their parents, by their father. A, a father could, if he wanted to, deny his daughter any food whatsoever. And this this is shocking to us. And I'm not saying that it happened, but it really shows how little women were valued in first century Judaism. I don't think that that would be the case anymore today among the Orthodox Jews, as I mentioned. But there was no requirement that you, in other words, a woman's right to food came from the marriage contract, okay? Now you might say, well, there's a moral responsibility or an ethical responsibility, you can argue that, but there was no legal responsibility. And if it wasn't spelled out in the ketubah, nothing could force a man to do something that was not already in the contract or already stipulated or spelled out according to the law of Moses. So there was also, so not only did women have this very, um, low level of autonomy and and control over their own lives that was very severely restricted. There was a very strong and clear double standard, um, ethical double standard in Judaism, which still exists for Orthodox Jewish men. For example, only a man could get a divorce. 
So let's say a woman was being badly treated by her husband. She had no right to sue for divorce. And this is actually a big problem today in modern, among modern Orthodox Jews, that a woman has no right to get a divorce. So she can leave, but she also doesn't have the right to keep the children. The children belong to the husband. So if a woman is suffering under an abusive man, she can't take her children with her. Or if she does, they're gonna find out where she is and take her back. And this is a huge problem in the Orthodox Jewish community. And sometimes the, the husband will, she will leave and the husband will not give her a divorce out of spite. And she cannot remarry within that community. Uh, in other words, as a Jew, she can't remarry. So this is a big problem. Only men could get a divorce. Women had no right to get a divorce. Only a wife could commit adultery. And again, this is very bizarre for us. But adultery was when a man had relations with a married woman. There was, it was not adultery if a man had relations with a woman who was not his wife, as long as she was not the wife of another man. So men could visit prostitutes, men could have a girlfriend on the side, and this happens even today, and it is considered all right, because legally, the only way that you commit adultery is if a man is with a married woman, other than his wife. Only Jewish men could testify in court. So let's say a woman was a victim of a crime. She cannot testify in court. And by the way, the only time she could testify was, or her testimony would be accepted, yeah. is if uh, she could testify to the death of her husband. If she saw him die and they were far away and there were no other witnesses, she could testify to that if she's the only witness. But other than that, but even that many rabbis were very uncomfortable with. What if she said her husband died, but really he didn't die, and we give her permission to remarry, and now we have a situation of bigamy. But women were not considered credible witnesses. They were perceived as such as so inferior to men that their testimony could not be relied upon in a, a court of law. Um, only men could offer sacrifice in the temple. Now, of course, there is no more temple in Judaism today. But I'm speaking about the temple and the time of Christ, when animals were brought for, for sacrifice. There were certain, only a man could bring a, an animal for sacrifice. So if a woman wants to offer sacrifice, she has to find a man who's going to go up and offer the animal. So there were many, many requirements for men that women did not have to keep. So women were exempt from many requirements of the law. And some people have said, well, this is because they had to be responsible for children that always fell on the women. For example, men were required to attend the synagogue services, to attend temple festivals, um, you know, certain festivals like Passover or whatever. They were required to make the pilgrimage. Women weren't required, but they could go. Men were required to attend. So women were exempt from many of these requirements um, because it was assumed that it would be more difficult for them to come because they might be pregnant or caring for small children or something like this. So most of the requirements of the law of Moses were perceived or interpreted as applying to men only, saying the daily benediction prayers synagogue attendance, temple attendance, sacrifices, and things of this nature. But listen to this. Originally, it was presumed that those laws did not apply to women because it says in the Bible, for example, every Israelite shall do this. And that was always interpreted to mean a man, unless it specifically mentioned women. So women were exempt from these requirements and over time, the rabbis and Jewish scholars decided that it's not that they were exempt from fulfilling these things, the requirement, but they were forbidden to actually fulfill those requirements. Therefore, it's not that women are exempt from offering sacrifice. Women are not allowed to offer sacrifice. That is not stated in the Bible. But that is the interpretation that they arrived at. 
So notice how they took the lives of women and made them more narrow and narrow and narrow. So now they're not just exempt. Well, you don't have to go to synagogue because you're pregnant or you have two toddlers or something like that. You're not allowed to go. You're not allowed to offer sacrifice. You're not allowed to count toward the minimum number of people required for a synagogue service. So this is a very, very different thing. So women were um, perceived as being, they, they were denied, um, not only, they were not only exempt, they were denied or forbidden from doing many things that were considered only uh, appropriate for men. Women were also considered to be the source of scandal and immorality and perversion. This is, I think, quite interesting because women were considered to be less moral than men. Now, today we would think that men, because of their drives, men are much more likely to be immoral than women. I don't know if that's the case anymore. But it was at one time that women were much more careful about that. They were they tended to be more moral and men tended to play the field, you know, as they say, be do do what men do, boys will be boys. That's why that uh, idea is in our culture, because it's more typical of men, for example, to, to be immoral than women. Typically, men commit more crimes, men are more likely to have affairs than women and things like this. At least historically that was the case. But not to the Jews. They always assumed that women were, were more likely to be immoral. And that shows you, and I don't think that's the case at all, because the women had a lot to lose. By committing adultery, she would be stoned to death, right? We already know about a story in the scriptures about that. So I think women were not likely to be immoral. They had a lot to lose too. If they got a divorce, they lost their children. They didn't just lose their husband, they lost their children. He kept the children and he sent her out. So, you know, I don't think that women were more immoral, but that was a perception of men. And that meant that it was necessary for men to control them because the women were incapable of controlling themselves and their desires. That was a, That is what we see enshrined in the Talmud, in the Jewish law and its interpretation. So, um, of course, they saw women also as a source of temptation. And this is not surprising. The laws were written by men. Men are usually tempted by women. So they saw women as a source of temptation. Um, by the way, we might see statements like that in a, um, let's say, in monastic writings. And women get all worked up about this sometimes. We have to remember that in Orthodoxy, most of our spiritual writings are written by monks, and they're written for other monks. They're not usually writing spiritual works for us who live in the world. They're written by monks for other monks, okay? So you might read something where it says, stay away from women. Women are temptation. You know, women are can cause you to sin and all this. People get all upset. Oh, how dare they say this? Women are the source of sin. Yeah, that's a man who's a monk writing to other monks. And of course, to them, it is a source of temptation. So you have to remember who the author is and who his audience is, okay? If they're not making a blanket statement. They're not saying to all men, avoid all women. So they might write to monks, avoid women. Women cause temptation. Women lead you to sin. Yeah, it does from, that's appropriate for monks. Different than what I'm talking about here. Here, these are general attitudes of Jewish men for all Jewish men about all Jewish women, okay? So women were considered a source of temptation, and this is why even in the Talmud it says, try not to speak, or certainly not to speak excessively to a woman. So you spoke to a woman as little as possible, and in public as little as possible. So maybe you have to purchase something at a, at a stall, or at a booth from a vendor, then you do that, but you don't engage in conversation. You try not to, you try to avoid that. And the rule was really men should not speak publicly to a woman at all because it would lead to scandal. And the rabbis even told men not to speak to their own wives in public. And they might publicly show affection to a little girl, but once she got to that marriageable age, like 12, 
they were supposed to be very reserved and not even speak to the daughter in public. So um, again, so if you understand this, so we look at how, um, and, and why is that? Because, oh, this is very interesting. Why is that, that women, men were told not to speak to women at all? Because the Talmud says, we see in the Bible, God spoke to men. He did not speak to women. So there are two places where God spoke to women. One was to Eve after she ate the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And he spoke to Sarah after she laughed when she overheard the Lord telling Abraham that she was going to become pregnant. And she laughed and the Lord said, why did you laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. And he said, oh, yes, you did laugh. Other than that, they're right. We don't see the Lord talking to women. And why is that? Because everything was run by men, David and Solomon and the prophets, all these people are men. But notice how they interpret that to mean that therefore men, Jewish men should not speak to women. Okay. So, and of course they consider this very uh, pious behavior. Okay. So um, women also, of course, were not educated, generally speaking, unless they were wealthy. If they came from a wealthy family, they would learn even Greek, okay? But mostly they were not educated. And of course, this made it extremely difficult uh, for them. And then they, they also then did not learn the Torah. There was some disagreement about this. Some of them, some of the rabbis felt that women should learn enough of the Torah to keep the law. But many of them said, no, it's a perversion to teach a woman the Torah. So now that we have something of the, uh, uh, and some idea of the daily life of Jewish women, um, how does that compare to what we see uh, about what we know about Christ? Well, women, because they were not educated and because you weren't supposed to converse with them, Women were never the disciples of a rabbi. That was absolutely unheard of. And frankly, rather scandalous. It's too bad we don't have any mention in this in the Gospels of the rabbis complaining that Jesus has female disciples, because he did, right? So when we hear the word disciple, we should, by the way, explain what that means. A disciple is any follower. And that includes us today. We're all disciples of Christ. Apostles were people who witnessed the resurrection of Christ. They saw him alive again after his crucifixion and then went out and spread the gospel. That's an apostle. That's many more than 12. And then the close to the inner circle of leadership among the disciples were called the 12. So sometimes in the gospels, we see references to the disciples. Other times they're called the apostles. Very often they're called the 12, or after Judas, the 11. So you should be aware that disciples does not, is a very general term, does not always mean the 12, and neither does apostle. Today, when we say apostle, we mean the 12 and Paul. But other than that, in the early church, that was not the case. So we had women apostles. I'm going to get to that in a minute. So rabbis did not have female disciples, but Jesus did. Now, how do we know that they were disciples of the Lord? Because mostly we think about the mirror bearers. When we think about women's involvement, uh, they go to the tomb to anoint him and they find the tomb empty. But they were involved in his ministry for the whole time. It's just, they're just not mentioned very often. Mary Magdalene is mentioned, a couple of other little stories involving women, we see them mentioned, but we know that he accepted women as disciples. Um, and how do we know that? Well, first of all, how many can we think of? So uh, I mentioned Mary Magdalene already. Who else was a disciple of Christ whose name we know? Unfortunately, we don't know the names of, I think he had many more women disciples than we know. But who else was a disciple who followed him and she they followed him? All, all, all the way to Jerusalem where he was uh, crucified. Can anybody think of some of the names here you can unmute and tell me who you can think of as a name? Go ahead, just jump out, jump in. Uh, 
Go ahead, Nisia. Who? Mary? Uh, somebody Which... spoke. I didn't hear. Nia? I can't. Oh. I didn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I, I my first one would have said been Joanna. I'm sorry, but I said yeah, Joanna. Joanna was one of the mirror bearers. Who else? Susanna. Mary and Martha. Susanna. Good. Who else? Mer Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha. Very good. Who else? Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, Mary and Martha. Mary, the wife of Clopas. Mary, the wife of Clopas. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. So there's a couple of uh, Salome. There, there's a couple of women who are mentioned as mare bearers. And then you mentioned the other ones, especially Mary and Martha. And Mary and Martha is a, kind of important, I think, because, um, because uh, of the fact that in that story, we see that the Lord chooses what Mary is doing. He praises her, and she is sitting at his feet, which means she was a disciple. That was the posture of a learner. So whenever somebody would go to school, the teacher would sit on a bench or a stool, and he would teach from sitting, that sitting position, and everybody else sat on the floor. And they listened. They were the learners. So she, he is... By saying this describes her as sitting at his feet, that means they're describing her as a student. And Jesus does not think she should get up and serve everybody. Instead, he praises her. So this is a very important passage. So that comes from the Gospel of Luke. And Luke mentions more female disciples of the Lord by name than any other evangelist. And he's very important for that. He's also the one who mentions... Joanna and Susanna. And this happens at the beginning of chapter eight of Luke's gospel. Now, one of the things that's very interesting there, he says that the Lord traveled all around Galilee with the 12, and he was accompanied by a number of women, including Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, and uh, Susanna and Joanna, the wife of Herod's chief steward, Susa, it's, and many other women. So he doesn't name all of them, but there's quite a few. So Jesus is traveling around Palestine with an entourage that is not solely, does not solely consist of men, but includes women also. This is very unusual and almost scandalous. Now, there's another point that Luke makes here. He says, he traveled, but also many women who provided for them out of their means. That means that the women were financing his ministry. Because if you think about it, they did go out. They had to buy food. They had to buy bread. They had to get a new pair of sandals if something happened and somebody broke their sandal. These men were not working, right? They left their jobs. They left their homes to follow Jesus. Somebody has to pay for this ministry. And Luke is telling us that among these women, these women were at least well off enough to leave their homes. They, obviously, they were either unmarried or they had very supportive husbands, such as Joanna. She's the only one we know for sure was married. And, um, and they are traveling the countryside with Jesus and paying for this ministry, for him to be able to do this ministry. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, so, so this is how we know that they were disciples and that Jesus praised this and thought that this was wonderful. So Judaism had this double standard of behavior that I mentioned. Only men could get a divorce. Only uh, men could offer sacrifice. Men were required to do this, that, and the other thing. On certain feast days, they were required to, for example, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, they had to live underneath a, in a little shelter that was required of men, but not of women. Um, they had to offer sacrifices for certain holidays that was required for men, but not for women. They had certain privileges that women did not have, the certain authority that women did not have. Christ, on the other hand, did not have a double standard. And I can't think of a single teaching of his which, in which he differentiates between men and women. There is nothing. Everything that the Lord tells us to do applies equally to men as it does to women. 
And we take that for granted. We don't really think about that because we did not come out of Judaism. But for example, for Christ, there is no such thing as ritual purity or impurity. When the woman with the issue of blood, and this is the reason why, because of that concern over ritual impurity, that they're, the men, Jewish men are almost obsessed with this idea of ritual impurity, she wants to be healed of her continuous flow of blood that she's had for 12 years, and she's afraid to approach him. This is why she's thinking, if I can just touch his tzitzit, which is the tassel on the end of his, uh, his, of his cloak, um, I will be healed. She was convinced of that. She had that faith. And so she's in this crowd that's jostling and bustling, and Jesus is walking along. It's a huge crowd of hundreds of people, and she's watching this little tassel on the, the, the mantle, you know, that sort of... Um, garment there's a long rectangular garment that they we see sort of draped across the men would wrap around and it was worn by men and women you see that in the bible movies where it's wrapped around and it goes diagonally across the body that's called the mantle on each of the four corners was a um was a uh, a little fringe um uh, well I just I just they called it a tzitzit um a little tassel, and she was trying to touch just the tassel. So sometimes the translation is says, touch the hem of his garment. They they change it to hem when they're writing for Greeks because the Greeks would not know why there was a tassel on Jesus's garment, but that was a standard. So she's trying to touch this. And then when she's, he, he stops and says, who touched me, et cetera, um, he doesn't scold her. How dare you come to this crowd and be being ritually impure? You have defiled all these men by bumping up against them. He doesn't say that. Jesus did not believe in ritual impurity. That must have been extremely refreshing and comforting for women. So, Doctor, yes. The, uh, and um, if you don't want to do this, by all, all means, you, you don't, you can uh, just continue with your narrative. But I, I think. It might be helpful because it does apply to the understanding of priesthood uh, as well that we, if we could just unpack a little bit more what ritual impurity is and why a, a woman's menstrual flow of blood would make them uh, uh, unable, therefore, to enter into the temple. What is it about blood? And, and yeah, you know, that's, that was you know, so much a part of sacrifice. It, it was not... It was, it was any bodily fluid. It, and you know this, Father, and this is also the case in the canons for men. What they call a nocturnal emission. Any, the recent emission of any kind of a bodily fluid was considered to be defiling. The Jews were very, very um, fussy about that. Um, so... So, so that that's that has to do with just ritual impurity, and, and yeah, there is a there is a lot of fussiness and concern in Jewish Judaism over blood, that blood is has the life source in it, and this kind of a thing, but um, but it also involves even, for example, for somebody who today might want to be an Orthodox priest, if they have killed somebody, if they have shed blood. They're no longer canonically um, allowed to become a priest, right? So there it is, are certain... there's, there's certainly a canon. Yeah, it depends yes. on the bishop and the exercising of that. Yeah, huh. but that's but but the point is that there is a there is a certain reverence for blood. But what happened is, I think what happened there was a certain reverence for blood and for the life that it represents, and it does for women. Their menstrual cycle represents life, the ability to give life. But doesn't does it not also excuse me for interjecting in, 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 have to yeah. do at, you know the the whole development of the blood and the use of blood and so forth we know it's all ultimately pointing towards Christ and it's pointing mm -hmm. towards so you know what when Jesus at the Last Supper yes. says to his disciples yes. and drink of this all of you this is my blood that's blood, perhaps right? the most shocking thing that he yes. could have ever said because the Jews didn't drink. The blood of anything they they That's wouldn't right. they they were it was completely forbidden. But That's right. in hindsight, we can think about 
what he's doing is he is, you know, it, it, it's it's making his, life. That his blood his is blood. the source of his life, life for all yes. of us. And therefore, therefore, the it, his blood, it should be his blood that's reserved for the worship. Right. The in the yes, context yes. of the worship and so forth. Oh yeah, but I don't. I wasn't. You're yeah. You're talking about the sacrifice of animals and the shedding of blood, and I, I wasn't going into yeah. that. I was talking yeah. more about, you know, women and, and menstrual blood. I, but I, I yeah. don't want to distract yeah. you, but maybe we return to this later. There is a there is another hand that was raised too. Are you are you open to receiving a sure, question? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Marcy. Yes, doctor. You said that the um that Jesus didn't believe in ritual impurity. And I'm just wondering why the church still practices um, not allowing menstruating women to commune. Well, this is a question that, that, that is a canon, but I'll tell you what the reason why this is, because and not, not all priests follow that. So this is something that you need to ask your spiritual father about or your parish priest whether or not you should commune. There is really no hard and fast rule uh, on this. So here's why. Some people will say because you're losing blood the time that you're receiving the blood of Christ. But when we talk about ritual impurity, here's, here's how the church approaches it. For the Jews, it was considered to be defiling. They believed in ritual purity or impurity. We don't worship God that way. That somehow if you've kept all of these rules and you haven't touched that or eaten that or done gone there or shared a meal with this person, you're okay with God. Jesus is constantly talking against that. The church's restrictions were designed for women, actually, not because they were impure, but because it was difficult for women to leave home when they were menstruating. For a couple, in other words, it gave them an excuse not to come to church. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, for those of us who have had periods, we know that sometimes they can be very painful. For some women, they're debilitating. And it's hard for men to understand this, but I used to get them. And sometimes you just have to stay in bed all day because you just have terrible menstrual cramps. So a woman was excused from coming to church in recognition of this. That's one thing. Another thing we have to remember is that even though we live in a time today when we have all kinds of devices to control that and prevent accidents from happening, they didn't used to have that. And for example, you might go to Greece and there's a church in a village, there's no bathroom there. So let's say you have an accident what do you do? And the women know this, men find this kind of cringy, but it's a reality for women. All of us have had leaks and stains on our clothing. And you, you don't, you know, today you might say, oh, I, you know, I can't stay in church. I discovered a stain on my dress. So you get in your car and you drive home. What do you do when you're in the village? You have to walk home and you might not have another, uh, a change of clothing that's appropriate to wear to church. You understand what I'm trying to say? So these practical things, there are places in, in, in Ethiopia and other places where it's just it's not, not easy to, uh, to make do. They don't have water to wash their clothes. They don't have the sanitation. So we look at that sort of restriction and say, oh, why is the church saying this? But it was really done out of a recognition that women, it's not that they can't receive communion per se, but that they do, do not have to go to church. And they're not considered as having committed a sin. Right. Now, there's a very, if I may interject, Doctor, again, please there's, there's do, a very, Father. Please do. Yeah. Um, you know, so Saint John Chrysostom, fourth century, one of the one of the great uh, fathers of the church, um, in speaking about a, a woman's menstrual cycle, said, "What God has created, you know, we can't ever say that 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 that's something sinful or something bad." Okay. You know, so he he was actually, um, in a way, speaking against. The application of this Jewish understanding in the life of the church about That's about right. ritual uncleanliness. That's right. But what happens is because our people were so uneducated, they would say, "Well, why, you know, why aren't you receiving? Can you, oh, she, because she has her 
period. She's not going to church. Oh, that means she's unclean. They took what they knew from the Old Testament and they applied that to the church. And that was primarily out of ignorance. So that's why today, although there are some people, and I'm not telling women to receive communion um, if you're menstruating, this is something for you to discuss with your spiritual fathers. I know that some of them don't want you to, to, to receive, and there's a reason for that discipline, but others say go ahead and receive. It's not up to me to tell anybody what to do, but the church really does not believe in ritual purity or impurity um, in a ritual sense. So these things were the same reason why after you don't come to church for 40 days after you've had a baby. And it's not that because she's, we talk about the churching of a woman or she's, you know, she has to be cleansed. There have to be these prayers right over her. It's not really that she, she needs that. It's because she needs to rest because she's just had a baby. And some of us know how exhausting that can be. The baby needs time to, to, develop its immunities and things like this. So the things that the church has put into place have really been for the benefit of women and should not be interpreted as suggesting that somehow they're unclean. And um, here, here's also how we know this. It's not that women are not allowed to enter the altar. Where did we get this idea that men can enter the altar, but women can't? Because we're used to seeing men in the altar. But women do, can, and do enter the altar. They don't defile the altar by entering it by any means at all. So um, anyhow, um, I don't know if there's any other comments. Let me just finish this and we'll throw open the floor for any other comments or questions. So the point is that with Christ, you know, Christ had female disciples. He did not um, differentiate between them. In his teachings, he didn't say these rules are for men and these rules are for women. There was never a distinction in the church between holiness, how women achieved holiness versus men. There's no different baptismal service. There's no difference in the grace that was received. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon everybody who was there in the same manner, to the same extent. And from this, we see that immediately that in the early church, we had women who were very active in the church in different types of ministry, they spoke in tongues, they gave prophecy, they uh, were teachers and healers and uh, preachers and apostles. So um, we know that there were female apostles. And this is also something I think it's important for us to recognize because an apostle had a certain degree of authority in the church because they were eyewitnesses of Christ. They were followers of Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. And um, they had uh, were eyewitnesses of his resurrection. That's what made an apostle so special. So St. Mary Magdalene, for example, today we give her the title Is Apostolos, equal to the apostles. And we add that equal to because today the term apostle is used synonymous with the 12 and Paul. But in the early church, there were hundreds of people who were called apostles, not just the 12. The 12 were called the 12. So um, among the apostles who actually mentioned, there's, there are two who are mentioned in the scriptures, and St. Paul mentions them as his relatives. And there they were a married couple called Andronicus and his wife, Junia, and they were both apostles, and Paul calls them apostles. So there were other people besides the 12, including women, who had this title. Now, I don't think the Orthodox Church has a problem with this, but the Catholic Church has a lot of trouble with this. And they didn't like it. Once I was invited to a Catholic Church, and they said, uh, to talk about women, what's the title of your talk? And I said, Female Apostles of the Lord. And they said, don't you mean female disciples of the Lord? I said, no, female apostles of the Lord. So who might be an apostle of the Lord? We mentioned them. All of those women who were his followers, like Joanna, Susanna, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, Salome, um, but also probably somebody like Fotini, the woman at the well, who knew Christ and may well have seen him alive after the resurrection. We don't know. She was, had qualified as an apostle. But this was very, for the early church, they didn't have a problem. 
saying that women were apostles, but the Catholic Church doesn't like that. And they deny that they were apostles because they associate being an apostle with priesthood. But in the early church, that was not the case. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop at this point and I'll throw up open the floor for conversation or questions or comments. Is your hand raised, Tula? Go ahead. Yeah, you can just jump in. Go ahead, Tula. Hi, 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 Doctor. Um, hi. Just, you know, um, I have a question about the altar. You said women are allowed to go back in the altar. And I guess it's my understanding that they can only go to a certain part of the altar, but not into the sanctuary um, where the table is. Where the Okay, the... so that's the altar, but that's what I mean by altar, the sanctuary. Okay, so let me set the record straight. No one can enter the sanctuary without a blessing from the bishop, men or women. Unfortunately, what has happened over the years is that because over hundreds of years, we've become accustomed to seeing only men in there, and then they would bring boys in to assist. Um, they, they, people got this idea that only men can set foot in there. And even worse, men got the idea that they had a right to enter the altar, and women could not. And so whether you call it sanctuary or altar, where the holy table is, that's the space I'm referring to. Now, even men, including priests, are not supposed to enter the sanctuary unless they have the blessing to do so. Of course, the priest does. He's ordained. But he also has to have a reason to be there. So he has to be performing some kind of a function in the space. He doesn't just go there to hang out or check his email or something like this. It's a sacred space. So there are women who are tonsured by bishops, and they, they we could say, I don't like to use this, the term because it sounds legalistic technically, but they have the permission as a, as a tonsured reader to enter the sanctuary. Um, you, boys, who, unless, boys who are, are tonsured as acolytes. But technically speaking, even if a man has been serving in the altar for decades, if he's not tonsured, for that service by the bishop, he's not supposed to be there. He should be tonsured. He should be given that blessing, that permission, because it is a sacred space. But because we are accustomed to only seeing men, this idea has grown up that women are unclean, therefore they can't go in there, but any man or boy could just because he is a male. And that's a really bad thing because it gives girls the idea that there's something wrong with them. And it gives boys this ridiculous idea of superiority just because they're boys. And that doesn't exist in the church. So I will tell you about two occasions where I've seen this, you know, recently in our, in our initial church, our very, our very first parish, we had a woman who served in the altar for weekday services with the priest. And she had the blessing of the bishop to do this. And this was because there wasn't always someone coming to help with the weekday services. So she was behind the altar screen. She would light the censer. She would have everything ready for the priest. That was her job. We didn't think anything of it. Down here in San Diego, we also had another older woman doing this also with one of the priests, again, with the permission of the bishop. In Toronto, not currently, but a few years ago, there was a younger woman, uh, maybe in her 30s, who was helping the Bishop of Toronto, the Archbishop of Metropolitan Zotirios, in the sanctuary of the chapel when they had their divine services. So it's not that women can never set foot in there, and all men can. It's just that we have to have the permission of the Bishop, and I think that would be a positive thing if we if we saw that, particularly in places where there's no one helping the, the priest or in a weekday service. That could be a good thing. That way men don't get the idea that somehow they are entitled to set foot in the altar just because, you know, they're men. I think Dr. May, may I add a, another story? Please do. Yes. It, it, it's from, uh, I, I heard the story uh, shared by uh, a woman, uh, a Matushka, uh, in, in the Russian tradition, the wife of the priest 
um, who uh, grew up with Blessed John Maximovich when he oh. was in France. And uh, he was serving the faithful emigres of, of mm-hmm. Russian Orthodox yes. that, that, were, that were in France. Um, and uh, the, she, she uh, shares the story of the fact that because there were, the men were so limited in uh, yes. the wartime and so many other things that not only she, but a number of other the young women yeah. Um, blessed by uh, by Blessed John Maxavovich to serve as altar girls and altar servers, and they participated in all of the 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 uh, pr- processions and all of these things out of out of a necessity. Out necessity. Of, yeah. And, and and how he would how he would interact with them and and relate to them. You know, the cathedral of the church at that time was in a garage. She, you know, they they were doing the best that they could with what they. With, right. with what they could at that time. So it's just another example of, we had a woman in, in our parish in, in Strasbourg, who we, I was the eighth priest in 17 years in this parish, wow. you know, wow. and, and the parish is really turning over clergy very quickly. So uh, Metropolitan Maximus gave gave uh, this oh, particular woman, Peoni Hatsakos, uh, who's still with us today in her 90s, um, yeah. the blessing the blessing to go in and keep the altar clean, you know, and, and you know, there would be periods of times, maybe even months where they wouldn't have a clergyman there, but he, he gave oh, her the blessing to be able to do what needed to be done for, for things to continue. So, you know, I just want to concur with everything you said. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Father. Yeah. That's, uh, this is something I used to hear when I was, when I was younger, Women can't go on the altar except to clean. And I said, well, if they're going to defile the altar, how can they clean it when they're going in there by going in there and defiling it? So, yeah, but the point is she was given permission by the bishop, and it was for that task. Okay, yeah. not necessarily to help with the service, but the point is she had permission. So it's not that they they can't go in ever, but that we always look to the bishop to give us permission for these things. But really, everybody who performs any function, whether it's chanting or reading or serving as a, in the altar, should be should receive a tonsure to do that because it really is a sacred task. And I think people need to take it seriously. Now, I'm not suggesting that all boys be tonsured because I think it's 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 a serious thing, and I don't want it's not good to sin. Um, so, if you've already been blessed for this sacred function. Um, maybe maybe we'll was, return to this in in the third session and talking yes, a little Father. bit more about yes, you know the, true, the how, how altar boys even rose the practice in the Orthodox Church is yes. is really very more modern and we basically adopted yes. it from what we saw within Roman Catholic practice here in the West. That's true. That's yeah. true because if you go to Greece, you don't see little boys. There are grown yeah. men that come and they help at the altar. You don't see little boys. This is something that. We kind of copied from the one, like pews. Yes, that's good. Any other comments or questions? I have a comment. Sure. Um, I was at a monastery once, a women's monastery, and of course the nuns served behind the altar, but that's they right. needed people to pray the pre-communion, uh, pray the prayers before communion behind the altar, and they took a couple of us into and i was like in fear and trembling <laughs> but they that's good. obviously the abbess had uh given her blessing that's right very good point because an abbess is like a bishop did you know that no the abbess can do, runs the monastery and she has that kind of same kind of authority as a bishop that's absolutely right but notice that somebody gave you authority and permission to do that we don't just take it upon ourselves to say well, I think I should be able to enter the altar, so I'm going to go. Okay, very good. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Well, Marcy, and then we'll go to Sula. Yes, my question is, I think it was Father who had said something about um, women being able to enter the, this um, sanctuary out of necessity. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to clarify, is that something that is um you know in the canons of like like women can only are only entitled to do that or uh, allowed to do permitted to do that i should say out of necessity or is that something that's kind of just like a given for anyone to be able to do i think that the one things are are done out of necessity 
that they're usually that they're extra canonical or they're outside of the norm. So it's just because uh, we haven't really seen women serving in the altar typically that we say, well, there, it's allowed when there's a when there's a need. But I don't. I'm trying to remember if there's a. Um, I don't. I don't. A, I, yeah, I don't recall one either, doctor. So. But could can, can we that. say something about the canons? I think this would be a Absolutely. really important point. Yes, um, brother. Oftentimes, particularly for people who embrace orthodoxy, um, you know, kind of as an adult and and come in through through a catechism, yes. you know, there um, we we have. Now, we can have a sense that um, the that w w the Orthodox Church is 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 keeping things the way that they always were, holy tradition, and so there's a there there there's a, a very strong sense of the goodness of holding on to what has been in the past, and and you'll hear a lot of people in church circles refer yes, to the yes. canons and and what canons say at any one yes, point yes, in yes. time. And uh, this is one of the things that I teach up at St. Tecan's. Uh, I don't I don't teach the class on canon law, but it comes up in pastoral care and counseling. And I've helped with the with the with the lessons on canon law. And it's it's so important that we understand can how the canons function in the life of the church. Yes, we have canons that came out of ecumenical councils along with the other other theological decisions, um, preserving and defending. Are the 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 understanding of who God is, how He's revealed Himself to us, as it as it pertains to our our the truth of God, which um, as we as we come to know Him, this this uh, affects our salvation, right? If if something is not being preserved and understood in a correct way, it can affect our salvation. So why why these are all so important? But the canons of the church are written and and were developed in a particular place and time yes, yeah. for the right. bishops to be able to exercise their pastoral ministries in the life of the church. The, the, the canons of the church are for the bishops. That's right. Not for all of us. They're not right. works that we're supposed to be studying as something additional to, to Holy Scripture. The first and foremost authoritative writings in the life of the church are Holy Scripture, not the canons. And, and it's the bishops... Um, responsibility to know when and how to apply the canons That's of the right. church right so a lot of times and, and it even came out a little bit in in the discussion that was had at the clergy lady assembly right that you know uh, about you know is there's a canon that speaks about um uh, ordination and these type of things our, our cleanliness we we need to appreciate that they were written for a particular place and time there's a spirit within the canon that that the bishops particularly are trying to discern and and so it can be a, a, um, an, a, an inappropriate or, or a dangerous thing when lay yes, people yes. Just begin to approach the canons and think of them as oh this is the yes. highest but yeah the laws that you know that, that that we have to adhere adhere to to be the most orthodox right 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 especially gee father thank you very much for that um Nobody should be reading the canons, frankly. They're not, they're, they're, they're really not useful for us. We shouldn't be looking up the canons and commenting about them or making decisions about whether or not the priest is doing the right thing or the bishop is doing the right thing or whatever. The canons um, are guidelines, like Father said, they were written in a specific cultural time and place. And when, um, and they're for the bishop to uh, apply either strictly or with economia, with some um, flexibility to excuse a particular practice. And I would, they're not useful for an ordinary person to read them because if you don't have a theological education, well, what you will not realize is that many can canons have been superseded by later canons, but we don't remove them. They, the old ones that are actually no longer observed are still there in the book of that contains the canons of the church. We don't organize them um, or treat them the way the, the Catholic Church does as canon law, where they are absolute, they're rigid, they're systematized and organized, they're section two, 
uh, uh, subsection A, uh, sub subsection parentheses one. We don't do that with our canons. Our canons don't look anything like that and they're not applied like law. So for example, we have canons that, that will say things that really do not apply anymore at all, but we would never say that they're not valid. We would never say, we don't remove them because like Father try, alluded to, it's the spirit of that canon that we look to. So it's, um, it's, it's interpreted and it has to be interpreted by somebody who understands what was the original intent behind the canon. So one of my favorites is that it, uh, the can there are canons in the church that say that priests are not allowed to, um, to stay at a hotel, at a roadside inn. Okay, so technically speaking, no priest should ever stay at a hotel or motel. Now, why was this canon uh, made? Because prostitutes used to go to those places, and it was considered uh, it could be scandalous, even if the priest didn't do anything wrong, if he would be seen spending the night, even if he's all by himself in his room, in one of those places. So today, we don't apply that canon strictly, but we still have the spirit. So, for example, the spirit of that canon might be if a, if a priest is invited to lunch and somebody says, Father, let's meet for lunch at Hooters. Well, Father should say, I'm sorry. I will go to lunch, but not at Hooters. Because, again, of the implication, of the suggestion, of the impropriety of the place. Okay? So that's an example of how the canons are kind of out of date, but still are alive in the life of the church because of, of the rationale behind it. Okay, we had three other questions. Uh, Nisia, Sula had another question, and I don't know if Marcy had another one besides the one that she asked, but we'll go in that order. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, sorry. I, hi, Dr. Constantino. How hi. are you? Hi. Um, this has been so interesting. I Two things. Father Theodore, I'm going to send you a message right now, which I want you to consider before you end the Zoom, but that's a different subject. Um, the second thing <laughs> is I just wanted to revisit what you said Um Jeannie, about in the very beginning tonight, when you said that we we the church doesn't evolve and things don't change because we're not we don't have the authority to do that. I love that how you said that. Did I say that correctly? Did I reiterate yeah. that? Well, well, the church changes very slowly over a period of time by the consensus of everyone in the church. In other words, it's not one person or a small group of people that says, we need to have this. The church needs to do this. And then they push through their change or one bishop or a group of bishops. When the church recognizes that something needs to change, sometimes a small group of people begins to do this thing, whatever it is. And the rest of the church sees it and says, you know what? We need to do that too. We're, and, and it gets becomes accepted over a period of time. And I'll give you an example. We didn't always have the Feast of the Nativity of the Lord according to the flesh, Christmas. Christmas did not exist as a separate feast initially. But around the middle of the, the fourth century, around the year 350, it was developed in Rome. And slowly, other churches and other parts of the empire said, you know what? Yes, it's appropriate that we have this feast that celebrates the incarnation of the Lord and for the birth of the Lord and human flesh. So it began to be accepted at Antioch and then in Alexandria and Constantinople. And the last church to accept it, which it took them like 150 years, it was the Church of Jerusalem. But eventually they accepted it too. That's how things happen in Orthodoxy. Very slowly, very gradually, with the consensus of everybody in the church. Is that what you were getting at? Well, that that and also just the way it struck me when you said it, I was just thinking about holy tradition and how people argue that we don't evolve, but that it's, you know, because we, uh, the church is under Christ's authority. That's what I was thinking of. And I just thought that was yeah, really because it's not happening. for us to, to say, it's not for us to decide yeah. what needs to be done. So the church, like you mentioned, as under Christ's authority, if a change needs to happen, that becomes obvious to people. And it becomes more and more and more obvious 
until the church agrees to do something. Everybody, but people come to that conclusion um, because it's obvious and it becomes evident. And that's the Holy Spirit working in the life of the church. But things changes don't happen because I think they should change or Father so-and-so or Bishop so-and-so. So they just decide to go off on their own and make that kind of a change. That, that's exactly right. Nisia, an example that I'll often use in catechism is uh, I'll, to try to understand how uh, Orthodox Christianity is the continuity of of the faith and the practice of the early church until the modern day is to is to say that just to ask this example or analogy if you take a picture of a person the first day that they're born or you know they're, they're a one month old baby and the same picture of this uh, and, and a picture of the same person a hundred years later when they're a hundred years old if you put those two pictures side by side how much do they really look like each other right they might not, at, on first glance, look very much like each other at all. Although, and when we do get older, we tend to, you know, begin to take on s certain features that are are similar to infants. But um, when you look more closely at the pictures, we can identify and see this is the same person. You know, not just two eyes, one nose, one mouth. That whole personality was there in the beginning, right? Right in the in the, in the genes of the person that over the course of time became more and more evident, more and more pronounced. And the person went through a hundred years of, of life, of history and how that affects the whole development of the person. That's what we have in the church today. We have that church and, and you know, passing on the same faith and practice of the, of the early church 2000 years hence. Thank you, that's really wonderful. I love that, thanks. Uh, Sula, you're next. Um, I think I probably know the answer to this, but I just want to bring it up because we're talking about girls in the altar. Um, when a child is churched, the boys, mm -hmm. the father takes the boys and he holds them and he goes around the, the table. Mm -hmm. The girls are only brought up, into, up to the Virgin Mary and um, Christ, that icon. Mm -hmm. And is, is that because boys are going to be priests could be priests someday Is that that's, the that's a reason it? that's that's a reason that's usually given there are some priests today who will bring the girls in too i don't think that they're making a statement that the girls might be priests but usually the reason given is because of the the, the boys might become priests someday and that's frankly also the reason why we have altar boys um and not altar girls because the fact is that there are quite a few priests, men who have become priests because they were inspired by standing in the altar and serving as an altar boy. I don't know if that was the case with you, Father, but there are quite a few. I've heard that story by many, many priests. So it gives the boys an opportunity to participate in a way and to see something that otherwise they might not be exposed to. And um, I don't know if you want to speak to that, Father. I, I was asked to to go into the altar to serve in the altar and i said no i was too afraid the altar was like too holy for me and i, I just i i didn't belong you never did. in, in my in my wow. own thinking wow. uh, and i think perhaps in some ways that can be a, a, a help because you know familiarity can breed contempt well, when when we allow young men not mature and they, yes. they come into the altar. Actually, when they're young, they tend to be much more attentive. They still have kind of that fear of God within them. But but once they become familiar in in the altar, yes. and, and they they lose the sense of what their yes. real yeah. is. You know, I think this is so so important. I'll talk to my altar boys about this. That when I ask them why they why they asked and came into the altar, almost all of them will give the reason because they get so much more out of the service. You know, they just, they feel like they, they're participating more. It keeps them more, more connected. And, and I will remind them that that's not why that they were brought in the altar. It may be a byproduct of it for them. They were brought into the altar to facilitate the worship so that everyone else who is attending the worship will have a, a, a deeper and more profound sense of what we're doing that that the worship life of the church is is this um the uh an a, a um 
replica or as much as possible. We're trying to to re um, uh, uh, to present in a symbolic manner with everyone who's participating in the altar in some way of the heavenly worship of what's actually going on in heaven. And so we're there to help other people to pray, not not. You know, it, you know, it's harder to pray when you're a priest. It's actually harder to I believe experience that. the divine liturgy because you're thinking of so many things. You have to do, yeah. I feel that way in the choir, Father. Yeah. Because when you're in the choir, you have to think about what's coming next. Somebody is next, next to you says something, or you're looking for your music. It's very distracting. You're not, it's, it's a, it can be more of a hindrance than a help. So yeah, it is a sacrifice to, to stand and perform a function in the church rather than just being able to be lost just in the worship yourself. So Marcy, did you have another question? Thanks, Father. I did not have another question, but um, since you're you're giving me the mic again, <laughs> I I would just clarify. So my question wasn't really about the canons. Um, I was just trying to, I guess, quote you guys because I I was I you know I heard you talking about it, but um, my question was more like uh, the I guess I want to bold the the phrase out of necessity like so are women are women only allowed in the sanctuary out of necessity no, or no. are women allowed in the sanctuary you know if they're given permission to regardless you know of necessity okay. it, look if there's a necessity and a woman needs to go on the altar and she's not tonsured she should go she should go like so let's say the priest says help me change the you know the uh, cloth on the altar she's going to go in there that, that's okay. But the point is, no one is supposed to be in the altar who doesn't have the blessing. That was my initial point. Men or women, there's nothing to prevent a woman from receiving the blessing of the bishop to be tonsured to serve. If she really feels called to do that, let her come to church, let her show her devotion, let her ask the bishop, and and if he approves it, let her serve. And if the priest, of course, approves of it too. But this has to be something that is an expression that comes out of the, the, the entirety of her life. When we talk about something out of necessity, that's because there's a need right now, like a baptism. We have a normal baptism, and then there's a baptism that might be because a baby's in danger of dying, so we are going to baptize it in an irregular manner. It's still okay but it's uh, certain concessions are made because of necessity. So women are not allowed into the altar only because of necessity. It's, we have to look at whether or not men should be in the altar. No man or boy should be in the altar unless they're tonsured. Now, as a practical thing, we don't, do, we don't tonsure all the boys. And that's probably a good thing because not all of them go stay in the church. And it's better for them if they're going to leave the church at a later point. I hate to say that, but it's a reality. It's better if they not leave having received that additional grace. That's how I feel about it, Father. I don't know how you feel about it. Much is given, much is expected. Yeah. And so, so the, in a sense, we're we're accountable for more. And we, we need to impress that upon all yeah. those. Who, like, and, and just to make it even more clear. So there's really no blessing. Um given for being an altar boy the, what what the prayer that the bishop actually reads over them is it, to to be an accolade is the is the blessing for a reader a reader yeah and so that the, the blessing for the reader really has to do with the person understands the the faith enough and has the ability to be able to read with understanding and to read in a way that edifies the faithful people and that's what's given to those who are coming into the altar so uh, when I thank you for bringing that back up, Marcy, I didn't mean necessity in in the sense of only as a last stitch. I meant it in terms of what 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 is what what is needed, right? Um, and it it really applies men and women. What is needed that the worship uh, fulfill its its purpose and it, the 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 means? What what has Christ handed to us as, as a uh, apostles to, to the disciples that has continued on in the life of the church until this day. So, you know, that I, if something like this happened to me when I went back to my mother's um, village in Greece. Alexis, do you remember this? When we went to Sotira and we celebrated the liturgy 
um, it, my, not in Greece, in Albania. Our mother was born in Albania. Oh. She came over to America when she was five years old. She was raised in this beautiful, beautiful village that's in between three mountain peaks called Sotira. And um, a liturgy had not been served in that church for a long, long period of time because of communism wow. and, and, the, and the lack of or, uh, Orthodox priests yes. to be able. Most of the people, the village were no longer there, but the, the beautiful church was still there. At the time when communism took over, the, the, everything that was in the church, the people were forced to take it out and burn it. And then they were forced mm -hmm. to take all of their rubbish and, 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 and trash um, and, and uh, also um, whether, whatever other, other types of um, menu, the instruments and tools for, for farming and manual labor and all the animals. And they were to be put into the church. So it was made into like wow. a stable and a dump. By, by the communists to discourage the people yeah. from working. Mm -hmm. After communism fell, the people go back in, they clean it all up, but it's hardly being used at all. And very few people are left there. We, I asked permission, got permission to be able to celebrate the liturgy, which is really just mostly my family that was gathered there. And there was one faithful old woman who oh. would help, help the priest the, la the last time that they had a priest you know, in the village. Wow. So we, she, was, she was my altar server she carried the candle she prepared the the censer for me she did everything that that i needed to do that i we needed in order to do the worship yeah so yeah i mean i, I hope you understand what, what we're trying to get at here i i personally would think it would be great if we saw more women um stepping into those roles so that we no longer think of the sanctuary as a domain of men but as a place where people come to serve with the permission of the bishop and the parish priest. That's really what it is. And um, uh, not that women are excluded or they're unclean or they can't set foot in there. Or there's something you know, terrible that's gonna happen to them. So that would be very useful. And by the way, during, you know, there's so many, I'm sure many, many stories, Father, about what happened during communism. Um, one, of the, one of a Russian priest who writes to me sometimes said that during communism, the the baptisms were all done by the little old ladies. They would take the infant to the church. There was no priest. They baptized the babies in the Golinditra and the baptismal font, and they did the best that they could. And that's mm -hmm. how they kept the faith alive. Which so, we understand that the royal priesthood of all believers in again in in a case where it, it, all uh, there, a priest is not present. Yeah, any lay person. Can do can can uh, do an emergency baptism. Them, uh, case, they're yeah. very simply following some of the most basic of the uh, uh, of the um, prayers and the words used in baptism in in those instances. So yes, there's there's so much more that I'm I'm looking forward to so much, Doctor, to for us unpacking about all of this. Um, but uh, I think. Um, we're getting close it's to getting our time. Yeah, it's getting very yeah, late. We, we started you. about 15 minutes late, yes, at least recording. So I think I think it's time to wrap up. Okay. Um, please, anyone, if you have questions for Dr. I see, Nisia, you have your hand up. If you have more questions, um, feel free to write me. Uh, I'll, I'll pass them on to her, and she that will help her to be prepared for, for session no, number two. Uh, Nisia, it, you, something that you wanted to ask right now? Well, I was just going to mention what I messaged you about at the end, if before everybody. Oh, yes. Up. Yes, please. Now would be the time. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. There is a really special program um, called Agape Circle. I'm not sure if you've heard about it. It is, uh, it, it, it's, it was designed and run by, it is run by Deacon Marcos Nicholas, who is from, I'm not sure which parish in Massachusetts. Sorry. <laughs> Um, Stephanie, which parish is that? It's St. Basilio's in Peabody. Oh. oh, okay, great. Thanks. Um, and Angela Ferrieri and I, and Angela's on this call tonight too. She and I and Stephanie attend uh, the Zooms and it's, it's a really excellent program. Um, his mission is to create a safe space where you can have, I, I don't want to definitely say what he's uh, thinking of behind all of this, but I, my take on this is that he creates a safe space and it's facilitated by him. Um, it starts out 
with prayer and then you read the daily scripture together and then there's a dialogos a dialogue about whatever comes to mind about that day's scriptural reading that you just read and it's so interesting because i have met really interesting people um and it's just a, oh i think it's a wonderful program i believe uh it's been he's been running it for a while and um in, and he is holding his next course, which starts this Sunday. And I believe it starts at 630 Eastern time. And I know he would really be happy if anyone here would like to join. I don't know if that's. Um, yeah, maybe um, uh, Stephanie, if you would have the information about how to contact Deacon Nicholas, you could put it into um, uh, the, the chat. Uh, before we close and people can we'll give a moment for people to be able to cut base there um but i also want to add that the one thing that i think is so great about this he is such a great way of so th the program is that you say what you're thinking and what comes to mind and then um somebody else will jump in and reiterate what you said and then they will join you in what you said, perhaps um, in agreement and maybe in disagreement. And then at the end of it, um, Deacon Marcus will say anyone else. And then the next person jumps in when they would like to contribute to the dialogue. So it goes around in a circle and it's super interesting. And you, and personally I've become, you know, I, I, I my hope is to become a better listener. And, um, and I think overall, you know, we can, by being better listeners, we can reach others in Christ. And it's just such a great program. I, I really like it. I've been doing it and now for this a year. If I could just add one thing about that also yeah. is that um, uh, um, Deacon Marcus had started this when he was doing his dissertation many, many years ago. And I was part of that original Agape Simple where the idea behind it was if you brought a group of people together and talked and were led into a spiritual discussion where you had an opportunity to share not only what you're reading, but also how it relates to you personally, that you will grow spiritually with um, with that group of people and, and um, move along your spiritual journey together. And it was a wonderful program then, and he modified it a little bit now the way he does it now. But it gives you an opportunity not only to read the epistle of the day and apply it, but it also gives you an opportunity to be vulnerable with the other person, people on the call, and really learn from one another on uh, the, the different struggles that, and tools that the church gives us to move forward. And it's not recorded, so it's confidential. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you so much um, uh, for for all uh, the ladies for sharing that. And I, I also know DK, Mark and Nicholas, so Mar Marcos, uh, uh, Nicholas and I, uh, and so I'm happy to support his his work and his ministries. Um, it, so the the email is agape circle courses at gmail.com. So uh, you'll see that in the chat. Doctor, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this, this is a, a wonderful beginning. I, I really am so, so thrilled um, and appreciate all that you, you do. We'll be planning to talk about next week about women being silent. So stay yeah. tuned. That gets even more interesting. Oh, I'd like to Thanks close perfect. tonight. Um, our, our discussion reminded me of one of the um, hymns of the resurrection. Every Sunday we have eight tones and we sing a different, mm -hmm. in, in a different tone, hymn to the resurrection. But the fourth tone, which we happen to be in this, this right. particular week, mentions in particular the women disciples, disciples. Who, who who are sharing the good news to the apostles, apostles right? That's right. That's uh, right. And, and that's what they're called in here the apostles but they're the yes. first the women are their first apostles the first ones witnessing right. christ sharing sharing about that's his right. resurrection so let's close with this hymn and uh please invite the others that you may think and as soon as uh, as we can we'll get this posted on our YouTube channels for, for other people to be able to, to uh, catch up and see the first session before next week.
Oh, and one last thing about next week. Initially, uh, doctor, I had told you that we'd, we'd start an hour later. That's not going to happen. I had to move that meeting or we, we had a chance okay. to move that meeting to another time. So we'll, we'll, we'll have part two next Wednesday, okay. good. seven o'clock. 7 p.m. your time. Very good. Okay. Fine. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having learned, having learned the joyful proclamation of the resurrection from the angel and having cast off the ancestral condemnation the women disciples of the lord spake to the apostles exultantly death is despoiled and christ god is risen granting great mercy to the world Lord Jesus Christ, dear God, bless us um, this evening. We thank you for our first discussion. And may you watch over all of us and provide that we can come again next week to continue our discussion through the prayers of the seven Maccabean children, their their mother, Solomoni, uh, their teacher, Eliezer, and of all the saints. And especially through the prayers of our most holy um, Mother, the Theotokos, and ever Virgin Mary, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Amen. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you again, Dr. Patentino. It's very good. Yeah. Thank you so much.